This is a great opportunity. I'm looking forward to this, uh, hearing uh, from all of these panelists and the ones uh, afterwards. I look around here and these are some of the most impressive people when it comes to political issues and I'm very interested in hearing from them. So let me start with uh, the four of you, uh, random order. I'll start on my right with Carol and it's the question of the day. Why don't more good people get involved in politics? I think there are a couple of reasons. Um, the partisanship which we will talk about uh, today is one of them. But I think also, since I've spent over 25 years in media, I'm gonna take some media responsibility. And I think that we've built up a system where we expect politicians to be perfect. And if you're not perfect, then you better pretend you're perfect. And if you do that, then you rule out most of the world. <laughs> and I can't tell you the number of business people I'll say, why don't you give back to your community by doing some public service time? You know, you don't have to make it your career, but some time in government. And they say, are you kidding me? Like, I could not withstand the kind of media scrutiny that looks at everybody I've ever dated, every business I've ever been in, every person I've ever had coffee with, and say that I have led an error-free existence. And if you can't do that, then, you know, I'm not gonna do that. So I don't think it's about money, I don't think it's about time, I don't think it's about pressure, the difficulty of the job. I think it's these expectations that we have set up in the community that we're, we're looking for the wrong people. I say this when you're not around, Vaughn, and I'll say it with you sitting next to me. Vaughn is by far the best political journalist in this province. I love reading your column. It's Thank required you. reading. Um, after you hear what Carol says specifically about the media scrutiny or more generally about the question today, what's your answer? Well, as it happens, <laughs> last evening I was talking to a former colleague from the media who this time last year was one of the most accomplished and capable broadcasters in British Columbia. And for some reason, beyond my thought, uh, she decided to go into provincial politics. And she's now <laughs> Premier of British Columbia. Uh, so I told her, Christy Clark, the topic for today. And she said, what are you doing on that panel? And I said, I guess I'm here to take the fall for the media. And she said, who else is on the panel? And I said, Taylor, Harcourt, and Sullivan. She said, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have something to do with it, although it's interesting to go back to Harcourt's book, uh, the first one, the one that I have trouble reading, not the nice one that he wrote, the second book. Uh, if you read what he says about the media in there, it's, it's, the book's a little old now, and it's still a time of mainstream media domination and all that, and concentration of ownership and all the old problems that have been there about the media for a long time. So we now live in an era of social media, which is going to make things more democratic, more open to people, citizen journalists, and I simply throw out for the sake of debate, I don't think the nastiness, the stuff that drives people out of politics, the the polarization, the only listening to the side that you agree with has changed a hell of a lot, even though the media is now a lot broader and more democratic. Thank you, Vaughn. Mike, uh, as a candidate, as a premier, and as somebody who must have recruited many candidates over the years, successfully and not successfully, what's your answer to the question of the day? <clears throat> well, first of all, I, I, I want to make it really clear. I think a lot of good people do go into politics, and quite frankly, I'm astonished that so many would go through the hoops and hurdles that you just heard from uh, Carol about and, and, and Vaughn, uh, who I agree, don't put this on record, is the, <laughs> the go-to uh, in the Vancouver Sun after the obituaries. <laughs> <laughs> Who's still around? Oh, I didn't make it. <laughs> I lasted um, him as well. <laughs> and and I, I, so I want to make that really clear. Uh, the, the people I've met in politics, 99.9% .9 are there for the right reason. That's to make a difference. They want to improve their community. They've got a passion for an issue or a set of issues. Uh, they're upset at City Hall, you know, like wanting to build a freeway along the waterfront of Vancouver. Uh, dumb ideas like that. So I, 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 I think we should recognize that we are well served. A, a lot of really fine people do run for politics, all parties. Now, I, th I, I think I'll just add to what Carol said, and, and as Vaughn said, I, I wrote a very therapeutic book when I left politics <laughs> called A Measure of Defiance. And then I gave a lecture uh, about um, 
a few months afterwards at UBC, the Vancouver Institute, and it was about 700 people uh, out at UBC. And I started by saying, <coughs> I want to mention a word, and I want to get your instant reaction and freeze it and be honest. And I'm going to do that now to you. Okay, you ready? The word is politician. What came into your mind? Now, I want to ask you, how many <coughs> had a negative sense? Put up your hands. Vaughn? <laughs> how many had a positive? I, I thought meal ticket. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, let's just finish that. Let's just finish that little survey. How many had a positive response? Yeah, but you're all former politicians or politicians, <laughs> right? So you get my point. So why would somebody want to go from being a fine, upstanding citizen who's respected in their community to be this thing called a politician? So, you know, think about why, why did we create that? Why is it dishonorable to be involved in being a political leader and leading your community's uh, important issues, the dialogue about them, the stuff that needs to be done to correct homelessness or dealing with First Nations, uh, becoming self-governing, self-sufficient. Why would you want to do it? I mean, you just answered it. And, and so it's not just the media, and it's not just the uh, people on when I would go on Christie's show or when I f wrote that book, Vaughn, and I went on Bill Good's show, and uh, this uh, Herman from Richmond phoned and said, I got you a liar, and you're cheating, you're a crook. <laughs> and I'm out of politics now, right? And so I said, listen, you anonymous, knuckle-dragging coward. <laughs> you're one of the reasons I'm glad I'm out of politics. And you're finished. Click. It was liberating. <laughs> and I think, frankly, elected politicians should draw a line and say, you've gone too far. I don't have to put up with being libeled and slandered and treated that way. And we should all, when we see somebody behaving like that, pummel them. Verbally, of course. <laughs> As an old ex-criminal defense lawyer, I'm not suggesting physically. So I think the root of it is we've just hit it. So how we change that and how we get more people engaged, and I'm, I'm part of the uh, board, Honorary Board of Governors of the Vancouver Foundation. We've just finished a fascinating piece of work. The major issue, do you know what the major issue of the citizens of the Lower Mainland is? Feeling isolated. Feeling alienated feeling lonely. I leave it there. Sam, any truth to the rumor that you were Herman from Richmond on the phone yeah. that day? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the problem. It probably was a politician phoning you because that is the nature of politics, you know. And uh, I remember my poor mother, you know, being so upset when people would bash me. I said, Mom, you know, I always have to phone her and, you know, explain, look, you're a boxer. You know, you get in the ring, and when someone smacks you in the face, it's your job. That's what happens. You're a boxer. You know, you don't be surprised. My God, he just hit me, you know. I mean, that is, and I think about how politics used to get done a few hundred years ago. You know, it was thuggery and blood. That's how things got done. And so we are quite evolved. It may not seem so, you know, the way behavior is, but... Um, the reality is you bash each other and uh, whether that's, you know, nobody's found a better alternative to all, uh, adversarial um, politics, you know. Whenever you figure out a good system, then they've done it many times over the, the, the millennia. Oh, we've got a great system. Everybody will just love each other and we'll move ahead together. That's what you call dictatorship and it's terrifying. And uh, the best solution we've ever come up with is this adversarial system. And it does guard against some of the worst abuses that we've seen in, in the past. Now, when I think about our recruiting efforts, I've often said that the, if you really, 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 really want to be a politician, you should be barred from ever becoming one. <laughs> Those are the most dangerous people. They want it so badly that uh, they will do things that probably sh they shouldn't because they want to continue being a politician. And you do have to 
you know, uh, accept uh, that you probably have a limited shelf life because, you know, there is this, uh, this stuff that goes on that will uh, diminish your, your public uh, capability. So what I, I believe is that we don't put enough effort into recruiting. You know, when uh, I'm quite surprised in the civic level, we're always shocked and surprised that there's an election coming up, you know. I mean, we should have known that. There is an election coming up. We need candidates. And so, oh my God, I guess we're gonna need some candidates. And you turn around and all the people are standing there and they're the wrong people saying, we're ready, you know. Uh, we would never choose ahead of our companies, nonprofit groups or anything that, by that technique. The way we choose leaders in political life is uh, quite amazing. You know, we, we don't put the effort into recruiting. Uh, you know, if you want a head of a company, you will go and you will headhunt. And there will be this long process of convincing good people to come and run your company or your association. And we don't have that same effort that goes into political. So those are just a few thoughts. So for the three of you who were in politics and no longer are candidates and can just you know, hang up the phone on Herman uh, if you want, you can speak fairly candidly now. In terms of recruiting candidates, Carol, who, when you look around, you have lunch with people, when you see people at, at meetings, who strikes you? Who should be in politics who isn't now? What are you looking for? What makes a great candidate? Everybody and diversity. But not everybody. Everybody. I think that you have got to get to get to the point of good decision making, you should have all kinds of different people around the table. That means different skill sets, different interests, different backgrounds, different ages. Uh, I always say with women, we go to the wrong women and try to get them to run. We go to this young hotshot lawyer who's just gotten married, she's got a baby, she's starting out in her career, and we say, you're a star, come run in politics. Well, I've done it both ways, with the little one and with them off at university, and it's really tough when they're little. And yet there's so many women that have had experience, whether it's through the home or whether it's through the professional world, that by the time they're late 40s, 50, like they have got time and they have got energy. And we don't generally go to those women and say, come and contribute. So I think we're missing all of the edges of diversity that we need within our, within our system. But I'm going to disagree respectfully with Sam because uh, I will be, idealistic and off on my tangent, but I don't think it should be a bash-bash kind of thing. And I hope that I never did bash anyone in politics. It should be about the arguments of ideas and different approaches to things. And there should be an arena, and this is where party politics stops it. There should be an arena where I can say, I think we should do this, the other party says this. Uh, I, you know, I was thinking today, if if I were starting all over again and the Prime Minister came again and asked me to run, I would make it a condition of my running that I would be free on very important issues to me to not vote the party line. Otherwise, I wouldn't go. Because you do see some good people who agree to run, that you know their past, you know what they've done, you can't wait till they get in there, and they get in there and they're squished because they have to absolutely do what the Prime Minister or the Premier says and you don't have any chance to debate. So question period is meaningless. I mean, it's meaningless because everybody's gonna to tow the party line so they just yell at each other. There's no real chance to say, I want you guys to think about this from this point of view. You might change your mind. We can't change any minds. We can't discuss ideas. That's a huge problem. You know, you say that that would be a condition uh, that you would require before you got in. Well, I would suggest to you the answer to you would be no. You know, and your answer and then fine. would be no. Yeah. But, but, but uh, Mike, w could you possibly imagine bringing in new candidates, independent, free-thinking people into your caucus and offer them the promise of being able to vote the way they want on issues? I think those are two separate issues. Uh, and I agree with Sam. I think that democracy is war without bullets. You know, it's, it's a better system than what's happening in the Middle East right now. And there's nothing wrong with the partisanship about ideas, about values and allowing different values and different ideas to clash. I mean, I'm an old criminal defense lawyer. We have an adversarial system in our, our court system. It's a heck of a lot better, our system of pre presumption of innocence and proof beyond a reasonable doubt, than the uh, old Soviet system where you're guilty and they just they put you before a court and then shoot you. 
you know, I, I, I think that we should realize that there's nothing wrong with partisanship. It's when it becomes thuggery. It's when it becomes a, 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 a grotesque sideshow, uh, as question period has become. It's when you get into really vicious negative advertising uh, that's just there to pummel somebody, and it works. I mean, there's aspects of our politics that I think we need to change. Now, I, I also want to say that, that we shouldn't just talk about elected office, because it gets back to the point of the uh, Vancouver Foundation's finding that people feel isolated, not involved, don't feel they can have any role. There's a thousand ways to, to become engaged in politics, and, and really important ways, like be a volunteer, be a community activist, you know, be Occupy be, uh, Vancouver, but, you know, articulate what you want to do. Injustice, inequality, huge issues, terrible issues that have happened in the last 20, 30 years. But then take it the next day. Just don't sit around like a lump in a tent taking up public space. Use it as part of a larger campaign to get engaged, get involved, and do something. And have a very real agenda that you can, people can relate to. They made a huge mistake by becoming the issue instead of inequality being the issue. So, you know, I, I see nothing wrong with partisanship as long as it isn't as ugly as it has got with question period being and, and negative advertising being the grotesque examples of that. Recruiting, I was uh, able, uh, as you know, Vaughn, I spent most of my time recruiting candidates before I became premier. And we had some, we had some terrific candidates uh, from all over the province, leaders in their community, natural leaders in their community. Carol, you remember who recruited me into politics was your hub, Art, and uh, Walter Hardwick after we'd stopped the freeway. We had, a, we had a phenomenal council, and Stephen Toop was talking about the role of universities. Well, I'll tell you, UBC supplied 10 of the 11 people on that first team council. You know, Walter Hardwick, Art Phillips, who was a commerce grad, Fritz Bowers, the associate uh, dean of engineering, Bill Gibson, who was the medical uh, historian in the medical faculty, Seti Pendiker, one of the world's leading experts in planning and transportation, Darlene Mazzari, uh, who got me to come and you know, represent the Chinese community, who are going to stand in front of the bulldozers who wanted to build that freeway, graduate of social work and mass with a master's program. And you go down the list and you, you can see that you can recruit really good candidates around big, important ideas and issues that they have a passion about and, and want to make a difference. So I'm, I'm not uh, hostile about politics. I, I, I love po elections, particularly that one where Bill Van Der Zandt came into town to run. <laughs> we gave him a guided tour and sent him back home to Fantasy Gardens. <laughs> he didn't stay though, did he? No, he didn't. He came back and became premier, only in BC. <laughs> Sam, as you and, and Mike know, if, if, if there's any level of government that has the potential to connect directly with people, it's at the municipal level. And yet we see low voter turnout. And I hear lots of people, and you must have before and still do now, who have these very cynical views about their government, their city government as well, but never really try to address that at all, never give you a call, never come to a meeting. So. What challenge would you give the electorate in terms of what they should be doing to get more engaged? Because up until now, we've been talking a little bit about the media, but mainly about the problems on the politician side. Do, do you see problems on the public side in terms of lack of engagement? Well, um, it makes me think about um, the thing that I hear quite often, which is we've got to get the voter turnout up. And uh, But from my point of view, when we're in the political battle, uh, what, you, what happens when you get the, the turnout up is you get less engaged people and therefore it's much more fruitful to use uh, really uh, negative ads or uh, you know, kind of dumb it down and to just use slogans and things like that. So that's when the PR guys really come in handy. When you get high turnouts, oh this is great we got a bunch of people who aren't engaged. Now we can tell them what they don't know, you know? So when you get a lower turnout, you actually get more engaged people. And the 
level of discussion has to be higher. So it's a very interesting you know, conundrum we're in. So uh, the best thing would be to get really engaged people and have everybody really knowledgeable. But there is a phenomenon called rational ignorance. And it's a very real one and it's hard to argue against. You know, okay, I've got a father with Alzheimer, I've got kids that I'm looking after, I've got things to do. Um, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna research all the candidates and have my vote one of 120,000? Or am I gonna put a little bit of effort into my kids and my father and you know, all the care that I need to do and I get immediate benefit and somebody benefits? So you call that rational ignorance and certain people say, look, I don't think that my effort is gonna be well spent researching everything and understanding the process. And there are some people who say, you know what, I'm not gonna vote because I just don't know enough about it. I actually respect that. And I don't think we should say that your only duty for, as a citizen is to go out and vote and put an X down because those X's really should be meaningful, you know, if you're going to have a good political system. So I'm struggling. I struggle with that whole rhetoric about, yeah, we got to get the rate higher. Why? So it legitimizes whoever gets elected and to do whatever they want. You know, the higher the vote level, the more X's they get beside their name, the more... Uh, free they feel to, you know, do whatever they think they, they want to do, you know, so I just thought I would put in this contrary idea. That's a great point of view, you know, I, I don't often hear people articulate that, so that, that, was, that was very interesting to hear. Well, what I've dubbed our digital desk has a, a question, I think. Yeah, we're receiving lots of great cards, texts, and tweets back here. For the audience's knowledge, if you have any questions, we also have roving microphones around, so you'll find them over here, and you can always just throw up a hand at any time. So we received this question by text. How would you characterize the good showing of the New Democratic Party in federal elections? Can a 19 or a 20 year old be a good politician? So partisanship aside, Mike, um, what, about, uh, what about the, I mean, either of the questions, but especially the second one, you know, a lot of people leapt to the conclusion that uh, the, some of the new NDP candidates in Quebec were this anomalous, weird result, and all of a sudden we had these uh, unqualified 20-somethings who are gonna right. be in the house. Uh, what's your view of that? Well, for the first time in my life, I really enjoyed paying Jill Duceppe's Canada pension. <laughs> 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 to see the separatists clobbered was, I think, absolutely uh, tremendous for Canada. And uh, so I, you know, I, I, I see it as a win for, for Canada. And, and my sense, and you know, as somebody that uh, has been involved with Quebec in a variety of different ways with as a, the Canadian bar and municipal and, and federal <clears throat> politics and that provincial politics, I, uh, I think most Quebecers are genuinely uh, social democrats, are into uh, communitas, are into uh, community focus, a collectivist focus. Uh, so what emerged from that were a bunch of rookies. Um, and from what I hear, uh, talking to people in the NDP caucus and, and others, that they're doing quite well. You know, they're doing the usual rookie stuff. Where's the washroom and parliament buildings, <laughs> setting up offices, and what is this weird thing called parliament and question period? They're coming along quite well, and they're doing well. And I think that's bodes uh, well for Canada. Uh, so. I see it as a, as a positive, what has happened in Quebec, and I, I think the challenge now, and it's not a, a partisan comment, but I think the challenge now is to carry on what Jack Layton did, is he grew from being this cowboy I met in the Toronto Council in the 80s with his cowboy boots literally up on his desk as a newly elected councillor to talk about, surprise, surprise, Carol, infrastructure for cities, <coughs> grew into a, a beloved and respected broad tent New Democrat leader. And I think that's the challenge, is for the New Democrats to build on that base in Quebec and to be a broad tent party and be a genuine good opposition and potential to be a uh, government in 2015. Vaughn, you've seen so many candidates over the years. You've seen star candidates come in. You've seen young people, old people, uh, you know, repeat candidates. What would be your sort of textbook description of the ones that 
the candidates who, who, who are bound to be successful and the ones that are bound to, to fail? What are some of the traits that you see? Is it age? Uh, what sort of things strike you? Well, I think you have to have a realistic sense of what you're getting into, and, and one of the ways you find out about that is anybody ever is thinking of doing it, uh, go talk to some people who've been in politics and, and talk to their spouses because uh, it's, you know, there's a big sacrifice of time and family and you need to know about that. Um, and I think the other thing is the people that probably come out of it happiest are the people that go in with a sense, I'm here for a while, I'm going to get some stuff done and then I'm going to leave. Uh, it's not all bad. There's a very nice scene in the legislature yesterday and I know the idea of a nice scene in the BC legislature doesn't actually go to most people's mind. But uh, right after question period yesterday, as usual, stimulating, rich, broad discussion, <laughs> um, Barry Penner got up and announced that after 15 years in provincial politics and three cabinet posts, he was leaving politics. Um, he uh, talked about having been Minister of the Environment and how much he enjoyed that and some of the things he got done. Uh, he reminded the press gallery of some of the reasons why we kind of liked him. He talked about almost setting fire to his cat on Earth Day. He talked about <laughs> his effort to save the marmot, the one, particularly the one that lives at the Empress. And uh, no, not in one of the rooms upstairs, but anyway. Um, and uh, look, Barry uh, has gotten married while he was in politics. He's got a little daughter who's the cutest thing you've ever seen, and she's named after a provincial park. We said, thank, thank God she wasn't born when he was Attorney General. She'd be named after a pre-trial center. Uh, <coughs> but uh, he finished. He's going off to a job at a law firm in Vancouver. He finished. Standing ovation from the House. Genuine. Adrian Dix, the opposition leader, got up and thanked him for his service to British Columbia. There are people who, if they left the legislature, the leader of the opposition would have trouble being sincere in thanking them for their contribution, but it was fully sincere, and Barry Penner walks off the stage. Uh, Fifteen years in politics, married with a child and going to a good job in Vancouver. What's not to like about politics? We should all do it. <laughs> Although politicians, and I'm sure all three of you can attest to this, are never more beloved than the day that they step down, right? And so suddenly everybody is your biggest fan, and why didn't you stay on forever? We have a question, I think. Um, I've covered provincial politics for about eight years now. And one of the things that I've always been curious about is how much of an impact do you think the constraints of caucus discipline and caucus solidarity have on recruiting good people into politics and keeping those people in politics. Because as you know, they're not really allowed to say much that goes off the party line publicly. That's a great question, obviously. And uh, Carol, let me put that to you. And that's really the point I was trying to make. If you're saying to people, I agree with Vaughn, the last person that you want going into politics is just to be there for the position. You don't want somebody who wants the glory or whatever, the name recognition. You want someone who has some ideas about what they want to come in to do and then to leave. And so if you say that, then you're saying, come to me with your good ideas. Walk through the door and I'll never hear your ideas again. And I think that's what really bothered me about the party system. And I recognize you're not going to change it federally and provincially. There's no reason for a party system municipally, I don't think. But you can say, and I didn't mean to suggest that every time I have a whim that I could vote differently. But I do think if you say matters of confidence, money bills, we're all together. But there is room if there's some issue that's really, really important to you for you to speak up and express it. If you can't express it, and in some instances you can't even express it in caucus, uh, you know, why are you there? Like, what is the point? I only come with ideas. And I've fortunately had two experiences, one municipal and one provincial, where I felt extremely positive about the, the situation. I felt that I had a chance to contribute. Uh, I loved the people I worked with. I really felt that... Uh, you know, something that we don't talk about, but the quality of our public service is essential to good government. And I was blessed with the Ministry of Finance that was unbelievable. So I came out um, not being a, a, a disillusioned politician, but being quite realistic about where I was rubbing against the system and felt uncomfortable. 
And Mike, I, I want to ask you about that issue, and we did touch on it before, but uh, you know, it's, uh, the way Carol says that, and I saw a lot of people nodding the first time she brought it up, people do see that as a frustration, and people do feel, I think, sometimes frustrated that their local MLA or MP suddenly can't seem to reflect their constituency views once they get in the party. How do we fix that? Well, first of all, I think that's a very naive view of politics. But Carol's view is naive? Naive view of politics. <laughs> I think it is naive. I, I, and and I, I agree with her that you should be able to have lots of opportunities to express a minority opinion. But, but politics is about partisanship. It's about values. Like, I disagree fundamentally with, with the values of the present federal Tory government. I respect Stephen Harper as a brilliant politician, a very successful uh, leader in terms of uh, the way he has uh, run his uh, caucus and party. But it's about the clash of different values and different ideas. That's what democracy is about. And you should, I think, as a party, have a clear idea of what those values are, put policies together that can be put into a platform that you get elected on, that the citizens give you a mandate to carry out. And the politicians who got elected were part of putting all that together. And that's the self imp You have yeah. to believe in every single no, no, policy I'm not saying of the that. party? No, no, I, I'm saying that the major thrusts of, of, for example, I made it a condition. If you want me as a leader of the NDP, we are going to change the relationship with First Nations people. We are going to recognize Aboriginal rights and title. That was non-negotiable. That was the reason I left city politics and went into provincial politics. Well, why would, why would I then have a majority of... Uh, the caucus say, well, I just disagree with that for a whole bunch of reasons, and defeat bringing in a treaty process in, in the legislature. So, so I, th I think... That's a great real-world example. Yeah. Uh, Carol, I'm, I love the new candid Mike Harcourt. I wish you'd been like this when you were Premier, uh, <laughs> but there are lots of things you couldn't say, I'm sure. But I'm not going to let him get away with calling you naive without giving you a chance to respond. No, I think, I think that I am naive, and I am oh, idealistic. for goodness sake, really? <laughs> no, I think that I am idealistic, but I think I reflect the views of a lot of people, which is why when you say politician, you get a negative reaction, because you get this. And so what people want is a different approach. And you can call it naive, idealistic. It, wouldn't, it would be messier than a dictator majority leader who says everybody hoe the line. I just think that, that people are anxious for a chance to hear some diversity of opinion, some individualism, and some really sincere debate about issues rather than somebody bringing down the hammer in caucus. I will, uh, I, I will, I will just, just, I will just one second. We're almost to the end okay. of our time, and I will give Vaughn and Sam a chance to weigh in, but I do want to put this yeah. question to you, Mike, about what you and Carol are talking about. The example you gave, yeah. you know, a lot of people in this room, I'm sure, would find the goal in dealing with your goal in dealing with land claims as an honorable one, and your desire to get that dealt with by government an honorable one, but what if a backbencher, a cabinet minister, somebody, but particularly a backbencher, feels strongly opposed to your goal, why shouldn't they be able to articulate that? Wouldn't that connect him or her and your party more with the public? Yes, and that happens, believe me, in caucus meetings. No, but I mean publicly. No, no, but I'm, I'm saying that happens in caucus meetings, and they then would go out, some of them, and ventilate their concerns about this, what the constituents are telling them, why they think that selling with First Nations people is going to destroy their ownership of their ranch or it's going to, you know, it's going to be unfair, it's just giving a small group. I mean, we let that occur, but when it comes to a vote on the budget or it comes to the vote on the treaty process, it's the centerpiece of your election platform and somebody decides, well, I'm all of a sudden going to freelance, that's when you have party discipline. Now. I agree with Carol, there should be far more opportunity for people to disagree. There should be a totally revamping of the committee systems so that MLAs have a real chance to have an input. And there should be a greater opportunity like this to ventilate, and Max, I think it's a great uh, institution that you've uh, got here, to ventilate uh, in a nonpartisan way about how we can improve our democracy. So I think there, are, there should be all those opportunities, but I think you still need to have partisanship in the best sense of that word. You need to have discipline about getting your budget approved and major planks through uh, and, and being implemented. And, and do you want a quick last word on this, Carol? 
Okay, um, <laughs> but I have, uh, this has been, this part especially has been fascinating, but I do want to give the last word to uh, Sam and Vaughn, uh, either on this topic, but more generally on this, uh, about getting better candidates, about political accountability, about public engagement, Sam? Well, um, when I read the history of BC and, and democratic politics, uh, we didn't have a party system originally, and it was chaos. It was wild, you know, and uh, not difficult to get stuff done, and uh, you couldn't really have focused agendas. And But I think there's a line, definitely, that needs to be drawn, and it, it changes. But I like the work that Max Cameron's doing, actually, with uh, the doctrine of the separation of powers. And I think a lot of our problems are because we don't have a very sophisticated governance model. You know, we are either in the city council level, we're dominated entirely by the legislative area of government, or at the um, provincial and federal, it's become completely dominated by the executive level, which it's kind of turned around. So I think if we had more of a separation where the legislative does things, the executive is separated, judicial, et cetera, we might have more uh, an interesting and uh, fruitful kind of government. Thank you very much, and uh, appropriately, the last word to the guy that always gets the last word on page three, but just, uh, are you going to read from your own column? Oh my goodness. This, this is a newspaper clipping, folks. Uh, newspapers are something we used to publish. <laughs> I always feel like I'm hauling out a 78 RPM record, hauling out a newspaper clipping. So Harcourt says that uh, the Vancouver Foundation, this is perfect. Harcourt says that the Vancouver Foundation has done a study showing that for lower mainlanders, one of the biggest problems is feeling of isolation. I've got the answer, okay? This is a Doug Todd column from The Sun last year, based on an academic study by two folks, one at Knox College in Illinois and the other one at the uh, University of Göttingen in Germany. And they looked at, for the Journal of Political Psychology, political activism, people who get involved at the lowest level, even in tent encampments, or on their city council, or as a volunteer, and what they found is remarkable. They found that one of the re those people, those people felt better for being involved. They felt better about their community. They met really interesting people. They felt like they were making a difference. They were happier. They had better relationships. So I highly recommend it. You're feeling bad, down in the dumps, isolated? <laughs> Go into politics. You'll love it. <laughs> <laughs> That was the perfect way to end, so thank you, uh, the four of you, thanks a lot, and all of you for uh, listening and your engagement.